Good afternoon, everyone. We know electric scarring is possible between planets, but also in the crust of the Earth between plates is also possible to arc. Andy Hall putting out a video explaining the supersonic shock wave accompanying this electrical discharge across plate boundaries or the crust, reflected shock waves. Supersonic jet engines experience the same exact phenomenon. And when I saw this slide in his presentation, I was like, wait a second. I live in East Tennessee. I see that exact same geology. And I had also done a video, the massive habitation, burial mounds of the Cherokee, all underwater through the TVA project. And I wondered why. Well, they go to such lengths to cover everything, including the prehistoric sites and near Chote. I do remember seeing a similar feature. And with the wind at a 90 degree of the shock wave, I thought, huh, let me see if I can find any similar geology. And not eight miles away from Chote, I saw the first one. And I said, well, if there's one, there's probably going to be others. And there sure were. Instance after instance across the Smoky Mountains going into North Carolina, some more discernible than others. And I started to mark them on a map. And I thought of Chote as the beginning point of the shock wave. Where's the end point around wave 11 clear to the east? And right away... Looking for Native American sites, I found Silva, the Judicula Rock. Megalithic petroglyphs, unexplained, lots of myth and legend around it. I am going to decipher this for you to the best of my ability. These were plasma displays witnessed from those people watching that shock wave. Electric sprites, check. Owl eyes in a residence field, check. Torrid plasma stacks, check. Squatterman, check. And here's where it gets strange. These Lichtenburg patterns, electrical discharge, but you notice the center. We can see the same from North Carolina going toward Tennessee. And if you follow that shock wave along, it does connect to yet another branching filament from the same discharge. That electric breakdown pattern between the moving charge, something special happening there at the terminus point. The Cherokee's largest cities and largest burial mounds are in this same area. So are the prehistoric sites in Tennessee, stretching back 9,000 plus years, stones in a row, burial mounds, star forts, and one of the most archaeological diverse areas in the southeast U.S., and it's all underwater, I think, on purpose. What are they trying to hide? Because these stone caves, quote unquote, are repurposed dolmens. The last time we had a Democrat-led Congress and president was during the first years of the Obama administration. Janet Yellen was the Fed chair then, and now soon to be the new Treasury Secretary under Biden. Obamacare was passed. President Obama and Congress sent billions to banks and Wall Street. That was the perfect recipe, and gold soared more than 200% from 2008 to 2011. We know Joe Biden is well-versed in the Obamanomics and raising taxes was the centerpiece of the campaign. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Patriot Gold Group has the No Fee for Life IRA, where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver. And you may be eligible for the No Fee for Life IRA. So go ahead and give the folks at Patriot Gold Group a call to discuss physical gold and silver and the knowledge that Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer five years in a row from 2016 until present. Click the link in the description box below for more information. And now on with the video. And as we enter this next planetary alignment in October of 2024 that hasn't been seen since 79 AD, almost a 2,000-year repeating pattern here in this planetary geometry the magnetic fields are going to start looping and creating its own separate Taurus magnetic field in the outer solar system, which leaves us only two planets away from Mars and then Earth plus the sun. So something interesting and strange, I do believe, is going to happen. So I've been searching through the past, understanding that Thunderbolts Project has figured this out. Our ancient history, the myths, the legends related to planetary discharge of body to body in space or crustal release of energy from one continent to another one plate to another we're talking something so large that it's really out of the human comprehension level because we've never seen anything this big before 
But Andy Hall put out this video explaining how if there were a discharge on our crust, the supersonic ground winds and the updrafts would create a shock wave that would separate particles not only by the weight but the element and push them into different areas with a very noticeable pattern. You're looking for that triangular pattern there. You'll have the material traveling with the shock wave and then rolling up into a certain area here. They call it reflected shock waves. There's an actual science behind it in jet engines. And you get this triangular formation on the flanks of hills, especially if there's something in the way to block that. There's mathematical calculations for this, multiple shock reflections, because it is a science. NASA has an enormous amount of information on it because they're dealing with Mach XYZ and their thrust as well as the military does with jet fighters. So you can see the same anomalies happening in the exhaust at supersonic speeds. Now bring that onto the ground level after a discharge, and you start to see the same reflected repeating pattern every single time. From Asia to Mexico, these are very precise. But if you look at the bottom right, you'll start to see something that is more in the general triangular shape and this slide right here was a catalyst to make me do this video and explain what I see here in the Smoky Mountains in the Cherahala National Forest because this exact pattern to the west there is exactly what we have here in East Tennessee. And I'd recently completed a video about all of the flooded Cherokee sites, the largest of the habitations, cities, Villages, burial mounds, sacred sites here in Tennessee, all underwater now. All of it. Including prehistoric sites, but they're all concentrated on this 15-mile stretch of river here. Very interesting, but the burial mounds are the largest. They even have to put navigation buoys because of marine hazard now in several locations that were flooded. Largest Cherokee city, you would never know now it's underwater. All that history deleted. So I use Google Maps to go ahead and try to show areas which now you can see the sandbars and the mud bars of where these vast habitations were, cities. And in there I noticed the exact same thing that Andy Hall had indicated except at very, very small level. And I thought, well, let me dive in and, and see if I could find something. But when they were cutting through to put the electrical lines, you can see there's a much more ridged contour there beneath the foliage. So this is where my quest started. When I saw this from a 90 degree angle where the shock wave is, then you start to see where that ionized wind and the breakdown patterns forced all of the debris into this electric triangle pattern for a better phrase to use. So then I started to just wide out my view from Chote and sure enough, within eight miles, this ridge here, you can drive right up there. I actually wanna go hiking and check this area out so I had a start point, and then I realized these are much larger than the one of the Chote. Okay, that's the second point to think about. But then I found yet another one, very stark, very clean on this. And I thought, oh, there's a hiking trail out there too. I'd really like to go visit that. So I had two points of reference, and then I started to see kind of generally which direction the shock wave was traveling. And then sure enough, as I kept going down that mountain range back and forth a little bit, I found the third one. Very clean, very discernible with that pyramidal triangle shape forced up in the ridge valleys there. And then I found another one, and I just started marking them on the map as I went. Because once you see this pattern and you know what you're looking for, you're like, oh, it's here again. And before I really widened back out, I went down to that ground view, and this is what it looks like in some of the pattern areas, almost like pyramids through the mountains there. Then I kept heading to the east, a little bit to the north, and then again found more of the same residual. And in North Carolina, it seemed to be the most stark and the most well-formed. Over on the Tennessee side, Chote is the termination point for that shock wave coming out and that discharge. That's why I think they put the largest city there. It's a very special energy resonance area at the termination point of that discharge. That's why that pattern is really small in comparison to what you see in North Carolina, because North Carolina seems like it got the full brunt, and maybe that was where the actual initial impact was for that electrical charge coming in on the crust. So here's what the map looks like after I've plotted all those from Chota, 
the Little Tennessee River area heading east all the way into North Carolina. And I thought, all right, well, if the termination point was at Chota and the prehistoric sites down the river there, I'm wondering where the termination point would be around Wave 11. I called it Shock Wave 11. Because according to Annie Hall's research, if the formations are 90 degrees off and they're all in the same direction, all those formations were following the arrows, then obviously the shock wave had come from those parallel lines. It looks like west to east. And I thought, all right, well, what's there? I started to do a little research to see if there were more Native American burial mounds, sites, anything that would have clued me in as to some special energy resonance in the crust that was left over that people found and set up their societies because it was such a special energetic place. It took me just about five minutes or less and I found Judicula Rock. Now, I'd seen a couple videos about this in the Giants in North Carolina. Judicula Rock, if you're not familiar with it, prehistoric petroglyphs carved on this massive megalith in the middle of the mountains in North Carolina. Now, they say it's undecipherable, but I'm going to decipher it for you tonight because I know exactly what it is. Doing the research here on the electric geology, and thank you for the Thunderbolts crew for putting out so much information over the years that I've learned. Here's all my research of what I learned from them, plus my own. I'm going to put it right here for you in one succinct package. I want to go through all these petroglyphs here. So if you take them off the stone and you lay them out into sort of a flat formation, you get all these. Well, obviously right now, people don't know what they mean because they're looking in the wrong direction. They're not looking in the heavens to see what these would have been as a plasma discharge event. So we'll start off with the easiest one, the lowest hanging fruit here, literally the lowest ones on the bottom there, Squatter Man. And it would have been this size at least. And if you want to learn more about electric geology and the electric universe and how myths and legends were formed with Saturn and different planets, Thunderbolts Project is where you want to head. So around the world, you're going to see the Squatter Man everywhere. It is the most basic form of petroglyph across the planet. And here you are. The left has more voltage into it. It's more highly charged. That's why there's extra filament starting to form off of it. And the one on the right there, the, it's a very basic. It's just at the low voltage beginning formation. But you can see how many Squatter Men are through that rock that's been scribed into the sky formations here. Now, moving on to what looks like centipedes, caterpillars, something nobody knows what it is, plasma display in the sky is what it is. Toroid fields stacking on top of each other. Now, we can come into a, a laboratory and mimic the exact same thing. These are toroids stacked on top of each other, terminus points. And we'll take a look at the two owl eyes at the bottom in just a second. But what can be replicated in a laboratory to what was seen in the skies, it's a very good match. And it would have been moving, too. It would have looked like a moving centipede or a moving caterpillar. They're everywhere in the world as well. It's, a, it's the second most common after the squatter man is this toroid stack. And they are everywhere across the planet, northern and southern hemisphere. So you can go two for two on that pretty easily. Now, the next set of glyphs here are going to be something, you know, with two eyes in it. And most interestingly, when I was doing the Cherokee flooded city research, I came across these caves in Tennessee that have the same exact cave art in the same exact what they call quote unquote prehistoric period, say 9,000 plus years ago. It's the same eye mask. So again, bring it into the simulations, bring it into the laboratory, see what you can create with that. It's a phase state change, meaning the voltage is going higher. So the resonance is going to be moving faster. So that it's going to, the shape's going to change. It's going to become, well, it's going to look like splitting, coming back together, enlarging, looping in on itself. And that's exactly what you see. And I know that's exactly what they saw in the skies and they represented it in these petroglyphs. Now, the next one here, Sapphire Star in a Jar. If you want to do any research on Sapphire, this is a, such an amazing project. I think this is going to be the future of energy, at least in some shape or form for our planet here. It's been stifled, though, because there's too much money in the traditional. But when you see these circular patterns with the center dot resonating, that one's easily explained. And I encourage you to go to Sapphire and take a look. And then over into Tennessee as well, the cave art sites, you see the same exact thing. They're showing you the phase state change, and this is carved on the walls, and there was some pigment as well. 
So as the energy input goes up, you start on the left, and as you add more charge, literally voltage, electricity, and bring and ramp that up, it moves faster because it's excited and it moves faster. Then it starts to change shape and state. And we start to see some of this in the Indian Vedic traditions here. And what do we see in the skies above? The same exact things that are represented in the Judicula stone. I'll circle them for you so you can get a better indication. There's a lot of writing on this rock. But going off the voltage scale here, that is near the top. So imagine how electric the atmosphere was and the sounds that would have been around. So if you hear about giants crashing through the forest and these types of giants throwing massive boulders through the air, that was the electric discharge on the planet. It's described in legend. That's exactly what Judicula was. The giants throwing stones, crashing forests, ripping the earth apart. That was this event. And you see it across the planet. Everywhere shows these same electrified skies. And Judicula stone is such a good one here. I'm going to bring you to the bottom jellyfish. They look like jellyfish. And people say, what are those? Well, those are electric sprites, red sprites. And these are becoming much more intense much, much more intense as we march toward this second magnetic field forming in the outer solar system, not seen in the last 2,000 years. So I'm also working on another story right now about the blue jets that were seen from the International Space Station that were punching a hole through the ionosphere, very visible here. So how would you represent that on a two-dimensional surface? I circled it in red. That's exactly what that punch hole is right there. Now, from the ground level, it wouldn't be that visible. So for us, it might look just like a straight up and then a tiny dot up there. But from the space station looking down, it looks very different. So if they were in the space station looking at these events, that glyph would be entirely different. Remember, it's your reference on where this is happening. So with all that said, now that's point A over there. Now here, I'm going to take you into the strangeness here because I really think these are connected in where the Cherokee set up their sacred sites based on the electrical resonance in the crust after this discharge pattern occurred. So Lichtenberg figures. You run a different charge through the substrate in the acrylic and then wham, you add an electric charge and whoosh, electricity captured in a medium. So this is what it looks like when it discharges out through known mediums. And you see when people get hit by lightning, they have that same striation, golf courses all the time. Whatever's hit by lightning leaves a mark like this. So out to the deserts here, when the riverbeds dry out, they leave the same exact pattern. So let's talk again about discharge continentally here. Because, you know, East Tennessee is on a craton, so New Madrid fault. That's kind of the separation point. So if you think about different charges, maybe California plate had a different charge than the one over here, New Madrid fault coming to the east, and then there was a, a differential. But there's something else that charged way above that would have been coming interplanetary, and this would have been just a secondary charge. So these Lichtenberg patterns are very discernible. North Carolina, if you're on the west side of the image here going north, that termination point up there, this is the big rivers right now on the Google Earth, so that terminates off toward Tennessee. And then at the bottom, if you follow the discharge pattern in the rocks, then uh, that ionized wind that pushed all the triangle patterns up, those two would have connected across the mountains. The blue that you see right now where the dams are, so it's very easy to see where the rivers are, but the rivers are the discharge canals in those fractal patterns. So like I said, here's where it gets kind of uh, bend your imagination. Think of what you're looking at with the electrical breakdown pattern on the left between the moving charges. How would that have left a different resonance in the crust? That blue arrow points to where that is, and you know what's there? All of those Cherokee cities and villages going down the river. You can see the fractal patterns right here on the map, and the prehistoric sites are there as well. The star fort is there all in this tiny little stretch of river that was the connection between that moving charge. And it's really hard for me to believe that people have been there for 9,000 plus years, that there isn't something incredibly special about this small area along the river that seemed to be the connection between those two discharge points going up into the mountains, forming new mountains, and going out, creating that extra build-up ridge pattern further west. Like Rose Island, 7500 B.C., people have been living there since then. 
archaic period inhabitants, the other area, one of the oldest inhabited areas. I'm going to say even Clovis, this was going on here. Permanent habitation sites. What's most interesting as well is the carved stones that were here. They found 13 stones in a straight line. That has been buried up and underwater, but they didn't know about Adam's calendar back then. But I am saying there's a connection between that. And there has been a rush to bury everything that was the past in this area underwater as quickly as they could. See all those marks off to the left? That's bulldozers scraping over the archaeological site. Yeah, they did some excavations in the early 70s. But this much of a treasure trove of not only the Cherokee, but the prehistoric peoples, the Star Fort and everything in this area, and they just wanted to put underwater as fast as they could. You can't even go scuba dive on these sites underwater now. They're not very deep. They put buoys there because they don't want your boat to scrape on it. It's a marine hazard, at least the top of it. You can't even get permission to go scuba dive in these areas. What do they not want you to see? That's the thing I want to know. Here's an interesting image of the Star Fort as well. Bottom is where Fort Loudon is. But if you look a little bit north there, there's some unusual straightness in the river. And then if you go to the very top of the photo in the back, remember when people were selling their land, generally it was the contour of the land that was sold. And notice that star at the very tip up there in the northeast corner of this image. Something strange going on with the geology here as well. we got all the burial mounds that needed to be covered up. And then looking at the satellite view here, yeah, you can see Fort Loudon there on the bottom. But... The strange, quote-unquote, natural formation of this all submerged. This is what it looks like now. It's under a lake. And the largest burial mounds in the Cherokee Nation in the east, my local, underwater as well. Such a rush to bury it up. So as we look back onto the wider contour here, I am going to step out on a limb here and say where that white arrow points to is where the discharge was at the greatest amount of damage and destruction on the crust and a reformation of. And that's what I said, when you get up into North Carolina over toward wave 10, 11, that had the much more defined pattern than it did further down around uh, wave one, two, and three. Although they were very discernible, but the perfection of way, you know, around 10 and 11, those two sites up there. And the Judicula stone, I mean, somebody was in Silva looking up at the sky where this arrow was pointing, seeing that event go on. And we have all this information that something magnificent happened in the past and was witnessed by so many people in this area of the country. The Judicula Stone, everywhere from that red dot going west, was witnessed, recorded, legends, stories. Cherokee City, Chote, underwater, couldn't keep it. How about Tuskegee, Tumultly? Got to be underwater. And you know what? Really, I can't believe it that they keep saying these dolmens are cave houses. Go to Europe and look up the word dolmen and see if you see any similarity right here. All they did was put a wooden face on it and moved right in. It's a dolmen. They were hiding from plasma discharge. Again, how many millions of dolmens were there around the planet until they started to deconstruct them, use them for roadways or building materials? There's only a couple hundred thousand or under now, but apparently there were more than two and a half million dolmens that were known over the last 200 years, and now we're left with just a very small handful. So if you're hiking in the forest and you come across one of these, please take some images and know that you have a dolmen and ancients were there hiding from the skies. And as we do come into 2024, things are going to get very strange with electric discharge in our skies. We're already starting to see it. You got white aurora borealis, those electric sprites that I showed you, those are real, those are right now. Those sprites are increasing in intensity, and that blue jet lightning, that's all happening now. There's definitely an uptick in electric skies happening as we speak and you listen to this video. Things are going to get real strange, and maybe that's why all the distractions happening politically and all these crazy things across the planet to keep you distracted from this event coming back again right now. Will it be at the proportion of this? I don't think so. Will it have an effect on our society and ability to grow food and feed everybody on the planet? Absolutely yes, and I think that's what the distraction's all about. My Patriots Supply and Adapt 2030. 
It's a great way to support the channel. If you'd like this kind of research, it takes me a lot of time to put stories like this together. If you appreciate it, join me on Patreon, forward slash adapt2030, or you can get yourself some 25-year storable foods in case you can't get out to the supermarkets and you see how crazy the world's getting. Just good to have a little bit of emergency supply around your house for your families and yourselves. Two-week or the four-week emergency food supply. The link's in the description box below, and all of the links that I use to get this information is in the description box below. And remember, it's 1080, so if you want to freeze the frame, you can take a look at the coordinates on the Google Maps and go in and look for all those Earth contours yourself. I appreciate you watching. Hope you got something out of the video, and I'll see you next time.